having to stand at the back. Hopefully you can still hear me and you can still see the screen. We were having some technical issues, but hopefully it's big enough for you to you to see. Good job for the guys that got chairs. <laughs> um, very lucky. Um, it's really awesome to be here. Thank you so much to Warren and to Erica for organising. Thank you to you guys for coming. Um, I was chatting to, to Jens Voigt. Do, do most of you know who Jens Voigt is? He's an uber cyclist, amazing guy. He's done about 25 Tour de France's in a row, but he's amazing. And I was at an event with him a few weeks ago, and I was giving a presentation. He'd given a presentation, an amazing presentation the night before, and it was awesome, and I was a bit worried about my presentation. And he said, don't worry, Chrissy, uh, to make a good, pre- uh, to deliver a good presentation, you have to have a story about being chased by a tiger. <laughs> I said, yeah, don't ever be chased by a tiger. You must have swum with a shark. <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't swum with a shark. So he just said, he said, so just tell us about that time that you did um, Escape from Alcatraz triathlon. And I said, I've never done that either. <laughs> so if, if you came here wanting to hear a story about a tiger, a shark, or Escape from Alcatraz triathlon, disappointed if you came here um, looking for energy gels and syringes and water and looking at me, then you are in luck. Um, can we... Oh, God. We're going to have technical issues now. How am I going to do this? Right. Yeah, it's not. Oh, right, we're going to have to... We'll have to use this and we'll have to cut the top off. There we go. This is about the one to talk about. Um, no, it's not to go with the syringe. And it's not, not that type of presentation. Um, it's a silver bullet. So what I wanted to talk about today was how to become a champion. And I'm often asked for my silver bullet solutions to success. So hence the silver bullet. And hopefully when you go away from the presentation, you'll have some ideas about what it takes to become a champion and be able to internalise those into your into your lives, into your training, into your you know everyday lives outside of triathlon. How many triathletes do we have in here? <coughs> awesome. And those that haven't put their hands up will be hopefully <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully by the end. So I am um, just rewinding a little bit. I grew up in Norfolk, as many people know. Um, it's very flat. It's quite boring. We do the high six there. Um, <laughs> And I grew up wanting to be a combine harvester driver. That was my dream. That was my aspiration. Um, You don't have very high aspirations when you come from Norfolk. Um, I was always really, really driven, self-motivated. Some would say obsessive, compulsive. Um, And I channeled all of that into my academic study. So all I wanted to do when I was younger is do well at school. And sport was something that I did very much for fun. So I did a little bit of running. I played netball for the the school team. But it was as much for the social side as as anything else. I never reached any kind of of physical prowess. I wasn't even competing at a county level for the... um, for the school. In fact, I guess the closest I got to the <laughs> world champion was when my mum, in her infinite wisdom, dressed me up as, as Wonder Woman um, for the fate. But I was actually looking through my photo albums <laughs> coming to this, and I realised it was probably the best one <laughs> because I was also dressed as a starfish, and that's my brother. <laughs> he was going to kill me, um, but he was dressed as a as a daffodil. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was that was the closest I got to to being world champion. And I carried my philosophy of, of working hard and doing sport for fun um, through to university. So I went to University of Birmingham when I was 18. But I was just obsessed with trying to get the highest grades possible. And I joined the swimming team at Birmingham. I hardly trained at all. I drank for them really, really, very, very successfully, um, but wasn't well known at all for my for my swimming prowess. Um, and when I left university, I um, I decided I wanted I wanted to go travelling. But before I went travelling, I was making a decision about what career I wanted. And 
I decided I wanted to go into law. So I signed a, a training contract for a law firm in London called, uh, was then called Level White, Durham. And they foolishly said, yes, it's fine, you can, you can go travelling. And I was travelling through Africa, and I started to question, I guess, the wisdom of, of going into law. I started to question the rationale for, for, for me choosing that, that career path. And I realised I was doing it because I thought I ought to do it. I was doing it because I'd done well at school, I'd done well at university, and I wanted to be a something. I wanted to give myself a label, and I think we all want that in some respects. And law was the career that, that I'd chosen. <clears throat> but I was travelling through Africa, and I saw sites that opened my eyes, and I met people that, I guess, opened my mind. And one of those was a girl called Jude. And I was talking to her about the wisdom of, of me going into law, and she said something really simple to me. And she said, Chrissy, look deep inside yourself and work out what your passion really is. And it sounds so simple, but most people don't do it. Most people don't know what makes them really happy. Most people don't know what they're passionate about. And I was the same because I'd never really thought about it. I'd gone to school, I'd done my A-levels, I'd gone to university, and I decided to be a lawyer because that's what I thought I ought to do. Was I passionate about it? No. But I wanted that label. And I realised what I was truly passionate about was international development. Ever since I was young and dressed as a starfish, I was absolutely passionate about the world around me, passionate about affecting change. I drove my parents mad organising Blue Peter, bringing by sales and charity events and litter collections. And so instead of going back to, um, to start my career in law, I carried on travelling for another year. Two years later, I embarked on my MA in Development Economics up in Manchester. And that's when I started running. I'd done no sport at all while I was travelling for two, two years. Um, and in Manchester, I decided I'd gotten kind of puffy. And the best way to lose some of the, the puff that I'd mainly gained in Australia eating pies was to start running. And I knew nothing about running. I'd done it as a kid when you just go out and you run in the rawest sense of the word, and I think that's how we should retain it. But I knew nothing about, about running, other than I went really red <laughs> when I ran, and I got really embarrassed, so I went redder. So I used to run in the mornings. And so I started off 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, obsessive compulsive person, this soon increased. But I was running in my baggy t-shirts, my old kind of second-hand trainers. It wasn't training, it was simply running. There was no structure to it. And I was chatting to my friend, my friend Amy, and the year before, so we're, we're in 2000, and, 2000 um, I was chatting to her, and that year she'd run the London Marathon, and Amy had grown up with a heart defect. And I looked at her, and I looked at me, and I had two legs and two arms and a fully functional heart, and I thought, what's stopping me? And I'm sure that's why many of us get into triathlon, because we look around us and we think, they can do it. I can do it. And it was the same for me, but with, with respect to the London Marathon. So the next day, I got a charity place in the London Marathon. I trained really, really hard for it, but with no knowledge of actual training. And in 2002, I, I ran it, and I was absolutely amazed by how much I loved it. And I was flabbergasted by the time that I managed to do for someone that didn't know a lot about running. And that was my first foray into endurance sports. It was my first foray into my, what was to become my first proper career, because I moved down to London and I um, got my dream job working as a policy advisor on international development to the, to the government. So during 2002, 2003, I was running a lot more, training a lot more with the legendary Frank Horwell, the late Frank Horwell, unfortunately, absolutely phenomenal man, and I was training with, with him and his squad at, at Battersea Track and juggling that with 
with uh, full-time work. And then in 2003-ish, I met someone else like Jude that would change the direction of my life. And you probably met a person like this and they say something very, very profound to you that you'd always remember. And it was, Chris, you should do a triathlon. <laughs> <laughs> And my reaction is probably the same reaction as many of you is, either I can't swim, I can't ride a bike, or I'm crap at running or my knees give out. Mine was, I've never ridden a road bike before. I, I really haven't ridden a road bike. And he said, don't worry, this guy calls, don't worry, Chrissy, we will lend you a road bike. So he lent me a road bike. And I bought my first road bike, which is a third-hand bike, which I still have. It's a Peugeot and it's yellow and black and it's awesome. And I've resurrected it and I'm riding around in Bristol hoping it won't get stolen. Um, but that was my first road bike. I had no clue about brakes and gears and staying upright and I'm still not very good at that. And, and I'm not even doing the cheer gel thing. Um, <laughs> um, but in 2004, I entered a couple of races, a couple of sprints. So I did the Eaton Super Sprint that I'm sure some of you have done. Um, I did a couple of Olympic distances, the um, Big Cow, Milton Keynes race, I don't even know if that's still on, and the Bedford Olympic Triathlon where I was swimming in duck poo, but it was fabulous. I didn't do amazingly well, I think I came fourth and third in, in maybe a couple, but I absolutely <laughs> loved it. No, but this is my age, in my age group, in my age group, right? I wasn't setting the world on fire in, in duck poo. Um, <coughs> But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, but at that time, I also decided I needed a career transition or break, as it were. So I decided to take a sabbatical from my job working for the government, and I took myself off to live and work in Nepal, where I was managing water and sanitation projects. In uh, at that time, the the civil war was at, was at its height. So I was in the west of Nepal. Um, well, I was living in Kathmandu, but managing projects in, in, in the west of Nepal. It was absolutely mind-blowing, and I, I learned so much from being there, and my heart still bleeds to think about what the country is, 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 still, is still going through after the earthquake. But when I wasn't working, I was, um, I was cycling. Um, even though I'd been bitten by the triathlon bug, I kept getting bitten by dogs, <laughs> and so I, I, I didn't run that much in, in Nepal. Um, and swimming is just a total no-no um, unless you have a death wish. So biking was my activity of choice. So I bought a bike. I called it Prem, which is Nepali for boyfriend, and we spent loads of time together, mornings before work, weekends, and this was our holiday where we um, went, uh, cycled from Lhasa, capital of Tibet. 1,400k over the Himalayas back to Kathmandu via Everest Base Camp. So this is just us um, cycling the last bit to Everest Base Camp. Um, and it was amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. It wasn't sport. It was just kind of activity at its rawest. It wasn't training, but it was one of the toughest things I've ever done, cycling through sandstorms and snowstorms at at 15, 16,000 foot. And that was the making of me. And I truly believe that we as people and me as an athlete have been shaped by so many things that have sod all, excuse my language, to do with the training that we're doing right here, right now. And people ask me, how did you become a champion? And I say it's things like this. Things like this that not a lot of people have, have, have been fortunate enough to do that have shaped me into the athlete that, that I've become. So I came back to um, the UK in 2006 and started my job again and thought, right, I'm going to give triathlon a really, really good go. Um, so I entered a very famous race, the Redditch Super Sprint. <laughs> don't even, I definitely don't think that's still going. Um, excuse me. So Redditch Super Sprint, it's not tropical like Hawaii. It was in May. I had no kit, so I had to borrow absolutely everything, um, even the race kit. And so I borrowed a wetsuit. And what you know, you always learn as a as an athlete, as a triathlete, don't wear anything new on race day. 
Well, I tried it on the day before, so I thought, I am fine. <laughs> <laughs> this awesome borrowed wetsuit. So I got in the water that isn't very tropical, not like Hawaii. And the bang, the gun went off, and the wetsuit, the whole wetsuit flooded with water. It's cold. And all the swimmers went off into the distance. And I couldn't swim. And I had to be <laughs> rescued by a kayaker. Um, so that was the end of the Reddit, Reddit super, yeah, not very super, but very sprint-like, because it didn't even last uh, the swim. Um, and in fact, that was the first race my parents ever came to watch. <laughs> and they never came to watch another race until I'd won the world championships once. And proven to themselves, proven to them that triathlon was was worth watching. Um, but the next race went well, and it was a uh, Shropshire Triathlon, awesome race actually, it's still going, um, which was a qualification for the World Age Group Championships, which were due to be held in Switzerland. And I qualified for those championships, and I got a coach, I trained intensely, um, about 20, 25 hours a week. Um, you can ask Warren about what that training's like because he decided in his infinite wisdom that he was going to do a little trial of my training back in 2006 and coupled with that full-time... Well, bear in mind, that was training on top of a full-time job. A full-time job. job. <laughs> it struck me that this was a superhuman achievement. I thought, well, I can't do the pace. What about the hours? And that was in March, and I am still bearing the scars. <laughs> the washing is just brutal. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, trained, I trained hard. I got a coach. Uh, never in a million years did I think I would go to that race and win my age group. Never. Let alone win overall. But that's exactly what happened. And I was just so proud to go to that race and wear the GB vest. It was such a novel, unique, amazing, life-affirming experience for me. Um, and to win that race was the absolute icing on the cake. And it changed my life. And we've got lots of points in my life that have, that have been really, really significant, but this is, this is one. And at that point, I was 29, and I had a huge decision to make. We all have these forks in the road where we're trying to decide what to do. And at that point, I had such a decision, and it was whether or not to become a pro athlete. And many would think it's an easy decision to make. It is not an easy decision to make. I was living in London. I had all my friends around me. I had a job that I loved. I had, you know, financial security. And I was going to give this up for a sport that I knew nothing about, for a lifestyle I didn't even know whether I'd like, and a sport that I didn't know whether I'd even be able to scratch a living from. And I was so scared. I was so scared. I was frightened of what people would think. I was frightened of not being successful. I was scared of the unknown. But I think we're all like that at different points in our lives. And I know that I never, ever want to look back and think, what if? Ever. I never, ever want to be left wondering what might have been. Um, and so age 30, in 2007, I became a professional athlete, triathlete, but only ever with the intention of doing short course Olympic distance racing, because Ironman was for really stupid, <laughs> stupid, crazy people and not me. I couldn't conceive, having run one marathon in my life, I could not conceive of cycling 112 and, and swimming 2.4 uh, miles before that. I just, I couldn't imagine it. It was for stupid, crazy people, and I wanted to focus on short course um, uh, racing. Until my coach threw me into Outdoors Triathlon. If there's a bucket list race and you haven't done it, add that to your bucket list because it's absolutely phenomenal. It's so great. It's masochistic. If you like hills, <laughs> it's amazing. If you don't like them, get to like them because this race is awesome. Um, anyway, so I did that race and loved it. And at the end, my coach said, Chrissy, do you want to do an Ironman? And I said, am I ready? And he said, yes. And within five weeks, six weeks, with my road bike, not, my, not a time trial bike that we usually have for, for Ironman, 
I had a road bike with my regular wheels, not race wheels. I had my regular helmet, and I always wore my regular helmet, not an aero helmet. I lined up on the start line of Ironman Korea, which was hotter than Redditch. Was 90% humidity, non-wetsuit, very good. Um, 90% humidity, 90 degrees, and I loved that race. And much to my surprise, I managed to, to win it. I never knew what to expect, and I never, never envisaged winning that race. And that gave me the qualification for the World Championships. Unfortunately, they were in six weeks um, in Hawaii, and I got a time trial bike in the interim and set about learning how to, how to ride it, how to change gear, and I flew to Hawaii wanting to try and get into the top ten. That was my definition of success. And never in a million years did I expect that to happen. Never. Um, and that moment, another one, changed my life forever. And not just because I'd become world champion, which was amazing in itself, because I knew at that point that I had the platform that I'd always wanted when I was dressed as a starfish to affect change. And I remember vowing as I, as I crossed the finish line that I wanted to use that opportunity to make a difference and to use the position that I had to, um, to full effect. Um, just looking back at some of the other special races in my career, I just wanted to flag up um, one more and then I'll talk about the last one in more detail a bit later. Um, one of the, the, race, the races that's very, very dear to me um, is Challenge Roth, another bucket list race. It's the <laughs> oldest Ironman in, in, uh, in existence. You have millions of people that come out and watch. This is just one of the climbs on the bike, but it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Such a phenomenal race. Um, and I'm really proud to have broken my world record um, at, at Challenge Roth. It's, it's a fantastic course and, and one that's really, really special to me. Um, I'll talk about my final race in Kona in just, um, in just a little while. But just moving on, I just wanted to talk a bit about what I'm doing now, because many of you know that I retired in, in 2012. Um, I just put up the Gandhi quote, um, and that's how I try and, and live my life. I believe that we all, no matter who we are, have the opportunity to leave a legacy. We all have the opportunity to impact those around us. You are all role models for everyone around you. And that's why I laugh when people call me a role model. Maybe I am, but you, everyone is. Everyone can inspire their friends and their family to do more. And we can all, we can all make a difference. Um, so some of the things I'm involved with at the moment, um, I don't know if any of you are park runners. I work full time for an organization called Park Run. I set up Junior Park Run. Uh, Park Run organizes free 5K runs all over the country, in fact, all over the world. We've got about 350 free 5K runs that take place at nine o'clock on a Saturday. And I set up Junior Park Run, which are 2K runs for four to 14 year olds that take, take place on a Sunday. Um, it makes my heart sing to go to these events, and it's so gratifying to do something to reverse the horrible, horrible trends that we all read about um, in the media at the moment about sedentary behaviour and apathy amongst our children. And when I go down to these events and, and see them for myself, it makes me realise that we can, we can do something positive and we can make a difference. Um, absolutely passionate about women in sport and trying to drive change um, with regard to that agenda, especially in the political sphere. Um, a couple of years ago now, myself and, and some other professional cyclists, Emma Pooley, who you've hopefully have heard of, 
um, launched a petition to try and get a women's race at, at the Tour de France, um, and we got about 97,000 signatures. And out of that came La Course by the Tour de France, which is a one-day race, um, which is now held on the final day of, of the Tour on the Champs Elysees. The, the inaugural race was last year. They had the, the second edition this year. But I'll c continue to kind of champion these causes and the causes that I'm truly, truly passionate about. Um, another amazing challenge for me is on a slightly different tangent, and you might have noticed <laughs> slightly larger than I probably was when I'm racing, but I am 24 weeks pregnant, so you heard it here first because I haven't really told that many people. But that's a new challenge for me. <laughs> And a new life journey, which is no less challenging than Ironman, and I'm sure much, much more. But we're, we're really excited about that. So moving on, um, I just thought I'd give some about what it takes to become a champion. Um, and this is the first one. Um, in my mind, you, you don't become a champion. A champion isn't isn't like a title that you hold, it's the way that you act. So each and every one of us has the capacity to be a champion in the context of our own lives, if that makes sense. And I think there are various strategies, various behaviours, various characteristics we can adopt that make us more likely to have success, be a champion in our own lives. The first one tongue-in-cheek, but very, very important. Um, you have to read the right material. It's not this. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's not. Um, the first one, the first strategy, or the first philosophy, I guess, is you've got to know what you're passionate about. You have to. So many people bumble through their lives not knowing what makes them happy, not knowing what drives them, not knowing what motivates them, because we're too stuck in trying to live our lives how we think other people think that we should. You know, Erica and Warren haven't always run 33 Shake. They jumped into the unknown and they followed what they realised their passion really, really was. And they're working their asses off, and that's why I'm really, really happy to support them. But what I admire the most is that they truly believe in what they're doing. So everyone should truly, truly believe in what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, secondly, you cannot be afraid to make a change. Yes, we are all, excuse my language, shit scared of change because it's the unknown we don't know what the outcome's going to be we don't know what people are going to think Warwick and Aaron didn't know what would happen when they launched 33 Shake but the worst thing is not knowing the worst thing is looking back and thinking what if I'd have done that because in my mind if you never try, you'd never know. If I had not dared to try the marathon, I would never have gotten into running. If I had not dared to try a triathlon, I would never be standing here. If I would not dared to go to Nepal, I wouldn't have seen and had some of the experiences that have changed my life forever. You have to be prepared to make a change, even if you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Because the worst thing is looking back and thinking, what if I'd have done that? Um, just more practical suggestions for being successful, especially in triathlon, <coughs> having a plan, but it's got to be sensible. So I just thought I would give you some more practical tips for um, what this plan should look like and how you should approach your triathlon training. And the first one is the most important one, is to remember that triathlon is one sport and it's not three. It's made up of three disciplines, but it's one sport. And I'm 
always amazed by how many people focus solely on the disciplines. They compartmentalise them, forgetting that in doing so, they negatively impact on, on the other two. For example, I'll have someone say to me, Chrissy, I want to improve my run. My run's my weakest discipline, I want to improve my run. And I'll say to them, look, what's your bike training like? What's your position on the bike? What are you eating on the bike? What equipment are you using on the bike? And they'll say, no, you misheard me. I'm talking about the run, I want to improve my run. And I'll say, I'm talking about the run too. I was a fast runner, not only because of the run training I did, but because of what I did on the bike in the race. The position on the bike, I was set up not as a time trialist, because that would close your hips off and you would be walking like a tin man on the run, if you can walk or run at all. You've got to open your hips out, so you need a comfortable position, not on a really, really aggressive position. Do you want your arms together so you close off your chest? Or do you want them open so that when you run, you're used to putting your shoulders back? Do you want to wear an aero helmet that may gain you five minutes on the bike, but you wonder at 30k into the marathon why you're dehydrated, and you're blaming it on your nutrition, or you're blaming it on the heat, or you're blaming it on the run? It's not. It's the decisions that you make on the bike that affect the run, if that makes sense. So what, you have to see triathlon as, <laughs> as one sport and not three. Your training plan has to fit with you. So many people are trying to match what their friends are doing and forgetting that you need to fit the training plan around you, your goals, and your lifestyle. Uh, a sensible plan will have four, this is at the most basic level, but four types of session, whether it's swim, bike, or run. So the first one is easy stuff. So steady stuff, um, easy pace, you can talk. The next one is your strength work. So in the pool, you'll see people using paddles. You might see them have pool boy and, and a band around their ankles as well. So they're doing strength work. Um, on the run and the bike, that's hill repeats, sometimes over gearing. So you're working on, you're working on your strength. The fourth type of session is race pace. Race pace works. So you're working on your race pace. That's how you ingrain your race pace um, into every fibre of your being. That's how I know without a computer, without a watch, how fast I'm biking or how fast I'm, I'm running. I know because I've trained myself to understand and to internalise that, that race pace. And then the last one is the one that hurts like hell and we all avoid it, are the interval sessions. They're the ones that are faster than race pace, but as the, the name suggests, you get a rest interval in between. So you need to incorporate elements of all of those pieced together throughout the plan. It does depend on what stage you're at. If you're an absolute novice, you'll focus more on the first two. If you're a more advanced athlete, you'll definitely start to incorporate the speed work. Sorry, but you will not get faster unless you do the speed work. You won't. You have to know how to hurt. You have to put yourself out of your comfort zone and do the hard sessions that really make you suffer if you want to get, if you want to get faster. It's not gratuitous masochism. You can't do it all the time. But you have to learn. You have to learn how to push yourself beyond what your race pace is. Consistency is absolutely key. Absolutely key, um, but you've got to be, you've also got to be flexible. Um, and I think all too often I see people that are sacrificing every element of their life for triathlon, and it's not healthy. The title is juggling balls. Um, for those that can't see, oh there we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd give you some suggestions on how you can fit triathlon into your life. The first thing to say is juggling those balls, fitting it all in, is part of the challenge. If it ever becomes a really negative stress, 
where you resent the fact that you're doing triathlon or you have to do certain sessions, then it's not for you. And that's fine. It's not for you. It should always be a good it should always be a good stress. So of course there are going to be days, maybe even weeks, where you just think, I hate this sport and I'm going to give it up. But generally, it should be, it should be, it should be good stress. Um, so a realistic plan, of course, fits around you, your lifestyles. Um, you, look at your, you look at your weekly timetable and you pick out slots that are always available. So you might know that on a Monday morning, your partner or your wife takes the kids to work, and so Monday morning, or Tuesday morning, you can do a session. Or you might know that on Thursday you get a lunch hour of X amount. Those slots are always available. So your priority sessions go in those slots. The other ones are non-essential and you can leave them. But you've got to make sure you identify where the always available slots are and then prioritise your sessions and make sure at least you do those. In our sport... There is such an obsession with volume. Everyone asks me, how many Ks do you do a week? How many miles do you do a week? How many hours do you do a week? I don't give a damn. It doesn't matter to me. Ask me how hard I work. Then I can tell you. People think they've done 35 hours a week, therefore that equals success. It doesn't. Quality trumps quantity every single time. You are often much better doing a 45-minute turbo session than you are a four-hour session on the road. Yeah, you might not have bragging rights because you've only done 45 minutes, but you've got maximum amount of benefit. So if you're time poor, choose your bang-for-buck sessions. They're the ones that will make the difference. Obviously, limit on your faff, multitasking, this goes without saying, um, incorporate strength and conditioning into your daily lives. You know, you could be doing butt clenches while you're sitting here, you know, you can do single leg squats while you're washing up um, or brushing your teeth, things like that. But if you, if you are time poor, then make use of, you know, don't sit down on the tube, but try and, ba I mean, I try and balance on, while I'm standing on the tube, just to give myself that strength and conditioning you might not be able to do because you haven't got, you know, 30 minutes to allocate to it. Um, importantly, share the experience with your family and friends. Triathlon does sometimes or often take you away from family and friends. So involve them in it. Involve them in the races. Involve them in the training. I mean, most of you have known, know Crowy, Craig Alexander. His family always come along on his long runs. The kids cycle with him and they set up aid stations and he does little laps. So they feel like they're part of his training. And that's really, really important because um, it's as much a family endeavour as it is an individual endeavour. But lastly, and I really want to emphasise this, people beat themselves up, me included, about what they haven't been able to do. Like, you might be shitting yourselves right now because you've missed a session tonight to come and listen to me waffle on. It's the reality. You know, there will be times where you're in work late. There will be times when your kids get sick. There will be times when you wake up and you really don't feel like training. Accept it as your reality and move on. Don't beat yourself up about it. you just got to do the best in the context of your life, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, saying that, <laughs> I like to see triathlon I like baking a cake, right? And that's why I put this picture up. Because it is so much more than swim, bike and run. So I know that myself and my competitors, Rini and Caroline Stefan and all of the other girls are doing pretty much the same training. Pretty much. It's something else that sets us apart. And those are the marginal gains that you've heard Dave Brailsford talk about so often. Um, it says marginal gains at the top. <laughs> um, Make marginal gains. Um, <laughs> this is really high tech stuff. Here. Um, but you've got to try as much as you can to take care of the minutiae. There's no point in cracking out 30 hours a week and then getting four hours of sleep. There's no point at all because you're undermining everything you want to achieve. 
So some of the ways in which you can make your marginal gains, strength and conditioning, really important. Rest days and rest periods. I used to hate resting. I hated it. It was tantamount to weakness. I could not take a rest day without beating myself up. Someone would have to strap me down, and that would be quite enjoyable. But you, you have to rest. Rest is part of training. Every amateur athlete that is juggling training with a full-time job should have a rest day once every seven to ten days. Absolutely. The pros don't, because guess what? We train four, five hours a day. We have 18 or 19 hours to rest a day. You guys don't. So you guys are trying to train like the pros and work and do everything else. It's not possible. You have to have rest and you have to see rest as part and parcel of training. And you have to have a longer off season. Mine was always six weeks at the end of after Kona. Have an off season. You have to detrain your body to come back stronger. Sleep, really, really important. Massage and physio, if you can afford it. Absolutely fantastic. Um, nutrition and, and hydration, I'll just move on to in just a second. But again, do as much as you can. The aim is to be the best you can in the context of your life. Not to beat yourself up because you haven't got all of these in order. Just do as much as, as you possibly can. In terms of nutrition, we can all make nutritional choices. It's an easy, easy win when it comes to training our body to be the best it can be. You can make a choice whether or not to have a burger or whether or not to have you know, chicken and, and salad. You can make that choice. So those are the things that you, that you can control. In terms of nutrition, I won't go into too much detail about my daily nutrition. We haven't really got time. I thought I'd go into more detail about my race nutrition. But suffice it to say, there is, there's this fallacy in, our, in sport that professional athletes are sucking on high sugar energy drinks and gels. And that's what makes us strong and that's what makes us successful. It's bullshit. We use them strategically. So I'm not going to stand up here and say I don't use energy drinks and I don't use gels. That's what I use when I'm racing. Occasionally I will practice with them in training and I say very, very occasionally. The, mo the majority of the time I eat wholesome, natural food. <coughs> that's, what I, that's what I live on. So organic, close to source, um, whole foods as much as I possibly can. Um, my, my race nutrition started way before the race. In fact, it's my daily diet is my race nutrition. Um, in the days before the race, you st I started to cut out fibre um, and spicy food. Um, the morning of the race, I have um, cream of rice, which you buy in, I bought, bought in America, but fortunately you can buy it here in the baby food department. It's just basically finely granulated rice, and you just add you just add water. Um, and I used to add peanut butter for um, for protein, honey for a bit of um, for a bit of sugar, a bit of sweetness, half a banana. Don't have the coffee if you're not used to coffee. It will come back to bite you when you don't want it to bite you on the run. So just, just bear that in mind. And I didn't have anything um, before I got on the bike. And then this is what I had. So I used to have... I trained my body to have about one gram of carbs per kilo of body weight per hour. I say trained, and that's really, really important. You train your body to need certain things. So if you train every day with gels and energy drink, that's what you'll need. That's what you'll need. But you can train your body to need less. You can train your body to need less fluid. You can train your body to need, need less fuel. And I did that very effectively. I naturally have quite a low metabolic rate so I can survive on not that much 
But I, when I raced, I had one gram of carbs per kilo of body weight per hour. So I raced about 60 kilos, so about 60 grams of carbs an hour. So if all of you go out on your five hour ride and you've got about a friggin' shopping trolley in your back pocket <laughs> and then that's gone after two hours, so guess what? We're going to stop for a cake stop <laughs> or have a coffee. Oh, no, and then about four hours goes by. Well, we'll have a flapjack and, and then we'll have a few more gels. That's what you're going to need in a race because that's what you've trained your body to need. So your body is trainable when it comes to Nutrition is what I'm trying to say. And I train my body to be very, very fuel efficient. Um, and then on the run, one gel in T2, six gels on the run, one gel every every 25 minutes. Um, afterwards, sorry, Warren, but I ate absolutely everything I could get my hands on. Usually salty, fatty, horrible, lovely food, um, because that's what my body really, 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 really craved. Um, so moving on, um, link to the marginal gains. You don't become a champion without changing, sorry, training your mind. It says your mind is the most powerful, is your most powerful <coughs> weapon. Our sport is as much psychological as it is as it is physical, and there are two reasons for this. The first one. <laughs> I didn't have this in like, my photo library. I had to find it. Um, do you know who this guy is? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you have to be born in like the 1970s and before to know who he is. It's Mr. Motivator. He looks like a 1970s, 80s triathlete. He's not. I think he was an ITV. But his job was to kind of motivate people. Um, what I meant by this picture is that we all are demotivated at points in, um, in time. So I did not wake up every day thinking, yay, great, I've got to train. You just don't. There are days, even weeks, where you really don't feel like doing it. It's fine. What is not fine is not bothering to develop the strategies to re-motivate yourself. If you just suffer that, Endure it, and da, 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 things will come good in the end. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. There are tools and there are strategies that you can use to motivate yourself. That's training the mind. And the second reason you need to train your mind is because the proverbial happens. It will happen. It is not all plain sailing. That is training, that is racing, that is life. And you need to be able to have the mental fortitude, the psychological aptitude, to be able to overcome adversity. Whether it's one off flat tyre in a race or whether it's something um, that's more endured in your life. Um, training the brain, top tips. How do you give yourself that mental strength to endure in a race? Because racing hurts. If it doesn't hurt, training hurts. But if racing doesn't hurt, you are not doing it hard enough. So first one, training alone. I know we all love to train in groups a lot of the time. Sometimes that's sensible because people can push you. But we race independently. So if you're always relying on other people for that motivation, you are never going to be in your own head. You have to be in your own head in training, and that means training alone some of the time. Remembering your goals, goals and your motivations are absolutely vital. It's not enough to say, I want to do Austria Ironman. You've got to know why you want it, and you've got to make it tangible. I used to put bloody post-it notes everywhere. It used to be my screensaver. In fact, it still is. But... Have your motivations and imprint them at the fore of, of your mind. Um, positive visualization sounds really trite and very American. It works. You've got to visualize yourself as strong and as successful. If you don't, you won't be. But you've also got to visualize what happens when things go wrong. 
So what happens when you get a flat tire? What happens if you, um, you know, get a cramp? What happens if your goggles get knocked off? If it's never happened to you, at least you can visualise it happened to you, and you can go through the process in your mind so that when it does happen, because it will, you've developed a strategy to be able to deal with it. Visualisation very, very important. Positive words and affirmations. I am as strong as an ox is much better than you're a wimp and you're a failure. You have to have a mantra. You have to give yourself that positive feedback all the time. Because if psychologically you're crushing yourself, guess what will happen physically? You'll fall apart. My mantra was never, ever give up and smile. And I used to write it on my wristbands. I used to write it on the top of the water bottle. I used to have it on my bike, everywhere. That used to be my mantra. I used to repeat it ad infinitum. Um, inspirational videos, music, poems, and books. For me, reading about people, sounds macabre, but reading about people that have had shit happen to them is really, really empowering when they've gotten through it. It really, really is. There are so many people that have suffered worse than us. And if you read about them and you think, my God, if they can encounter something, overcome it, and succeed, so can I. And so I, you know, before races especially, I used to read a lot of kind of books. So Steve Redgrave's book, Inspired, is absolutely fantastic. I used to watch YouTube videos, um, poems. Those that know me know that I'm evangelical about Rudyard Kipling's If. So I think it's an amazing poem. And if you ever read one poem and print it off and carry it with you, carry that one. It's phenomenal. But they can really, really give you a boost that you need. Um, then more practical suggestions. Never see the race or the session in the entirety. So I never started an Ironman thinking, oh God, I've got 100 and whatever miles to do. I think I've got to get to that swim boy. Then I've got to get onto the bike. Then it was 40 K increments on the bike and then the marathon was four lots of 10 K and change. You break it down so you never see everything in the entirety. If you've got a set of <coughs> intervals to do in training, just do one, then do the next one and then the 10th one will take care of itself. But just break it down into small manageable segments. You know, when the going gets really tough in races, you're thinking about getting to an aid station, getting to the person in front of you, getting to your support team that are X miles down the road. Um, Really important is to stay in the moment. I think often we get carried away with our emotions when we're racing. So we get a stomach cramp and we think, right, this is the end. Or, you know, you get a bit of a stitch. Oh, God, my race is over. It's not. A race is an ebb and a flow. You will go through times in a race and it will strike at different points, not necessarily towards the end, where you think, I can't finish, I feel crap. This hurts, that hurts, they're going faster than me. Things change, things evolve. There have been every single race I've ever done, I've wanted to quit. At some point, I thought, this is not your day, you're going like a plank of wood, just pull over to the side. But experience tells me that that feeling will fade. And so you have to stay in the moment and have confidence that you will overcome that sensation and that your body will come good. Um, the last one, test yourself and recall your ability to cope. Really, really important. So every time you question yourself, look back at another time where you thought you couldn't do something and you managed it. And that's why those hard sessions are really, really important. Because you look back, especially when you're racing, you look back and you think, actually, I did that session. I didn't think I could do it, but I did. Or I thought I was going to pull out of that race and I carried on and I finished. I can do it again. And that should give you peace of mind and, and confidence. And finally, before you all die of fatigue and cramp at the back, um, I just thought I'd give you an example of a time where I believe that I used as much psychological strength as physical strength to achieve success. Um, it was my last race at Kona that I said I, I briefly wanted to touch on. Um, many of you know, two weeks before, um, I had a little altercation with the tarmac. It kind of left marks. Um, but I had third degree burns all over my body and I pulled my pectoral muscle and just had really severe bruising. And 
a lot of those two weeks I was in and out of hospital getting all the wounds scrubbed out and I remember Dave Scott my coach and my now husband Tom I tried to get in the pool and I managed a length and I couldn't even swim back and they had to get me and like carry me like a baby out of the pool and and back into into the car in my in my swimsuit um my body was in a pretty dire state and psychologically I was um riddled with with self-doubt fortunately in the kind of three or four days before my body started to come round but I I was still relatively compromised um and I went into that race I'd re-evaluated my goals and all I wanted to do was finish I wanted to give it everything number one and I wanted to finish um and never in a million years would I have expected to win I wouldn't maybe I didn't dare let myself imagine it but I didn't and that race was as much a test of psychological strength as it was physical physical strength um and that's why it's the race I'm most proud of it's not my fastest race by any means but the number of the number on the clock and I wish everyone would learn that is relevant it's not a measure of how hard you've worked the number on the clock is not a measure of how hard you have worked and how successful you are the feeling of success comes from within and it comes from knowing that you've given something absolutely everything and that's why that race was perfect and not because it was perfect it wasn't perfect because so many things happened so many things went wrong before and during but it was perfect because I overcome imperfections perfectly if that makes sense and we're all out there and we're all expecting our races to go perfectly we don't want anything to go wrong that ain't going to happen we do triathlon, they're two hours long, they're three hours long, they're nine, 17 hours long. Things are going to happen. Your perfect race is when you deal with things, it's deal with imperfections perfectly. And that race was the battle I'd always craved within myself, the battle I craved with all my competitors. And when I crossed that finish line, I was absolutely annihilated. And I knew then that I'd answered every single question I'd ever asked of myself and that's why I retired because I knew that that was the challenge that I'd sought and at that point the challenge dissipated and I totally get that Ironman triathlon endurance sports are the biggest challenge for each and every one of us at different stages in our lives but for me at that point I'd achieved the biggest challenge that I'd set myself and I knew then that the time was right to move on, however scary that that change may be. Um, so just to finish off, the last philosophy, um, the last, I guess, secret to success, um, and this is in my photo library. Um, this is a little guy called JJ or Joshua and I met him God, way back now um, and the, fir the first thing that JJ said to me what, when we met was Chrissy do you want to race <laughs> and it made me think because JJ didn't care that I was world champion and he didn't care that he was three <laughs> and he didn't care that he didn't have any legs his legs are amputated here. Um, to JJ, and I think with many kids, those that have kids, there, there aren't any limits to what they can achieve. And winning that race in Kona really empowered me because it made me realise that I'd still put limits on myself that I thought, oh, you can't, you can't win this. I don't know if you can do that. Oh, you're never going to be able to achieve this. And yet I had done. And I'd surpassed my own expectations. And so I think the, the biggest silver bullet of all is that we should all try and remember that our limits are not where we think we are.
think, sorry, not where we think they are. Because they're not. You're only constrained by what you think you can't do. And it bears no resemblance to reality in terms of what you actually can do. Thank you. tight clock to get back to Bristol, but we have 15 minutes for Q&A, 15 minutes for photos and autographs and anything afterwards. That's going to start now. Is that good with you, Christy? That's good with me. If we think that signing is going to take longer than 15 minutes, because everyone's going to stay, then I suggest we start that straight away. If a lot of people are going to leave and not want signatures and things, which is absolutely fine. I won't take offence. You won't be invited again. Um, um, then, by all means, ask, ask, feel free to ask me questions. It's just I'm just really conscious. I don't want to get halfway through the signing and be like, I've got to go and get my train. So. Um, we well, do love a long answer. Why don't we limit it? We'll start on three questions. Okay, see how let's start on three questions. I'll Question number do... one. Anything from the floor? Hands up. Okay. How do you value your coach? My coach. How did I, I find him? A coach. You having a coach for? Value him. Um, you any? I think you having yeah. a coach. Um, for me, it was an app, app. My coach. My coaches have been integral parts of my team. Absolutely. It depends on your personality. I I need needed someone to rein me in, um, and that was the value of of the coach as much as as their expertise. Um, someone to control me, someone to stop me doing too much, someone to tell me to rest when I wasn't able to myself. Um, and this, the second benefit for me had nothing to do with the physical training, it was the psychological training, especially my, my first triathlon coach or my first professional triathlon coach, Brett Sutton. Um, he, he changed my mind in, in so many ways and made me into the, a warrior that I wasn't previously. Yes, he enabled me to um, enhance my talent, my physical talents, but he totally changed me psychologically. Basically, when I went to him, he said, look, you'll be a success physically, but only if I chop your head off. And that's what he proceeded to do. Chop the head off that I had, put a new head on so that I could think calmly under pressure, so that I wasn't overly analytical, um, so that I didn't question everything, because that's what I was like. Um, and so I think the benefit for me personally was as much psychological as it is as it is physical. Not all coaches are made equal. And unfortunately for us, it's a bit of a minefield because you can pay 300 quid, go on a level one coaching course, and call yourself a coach and charge you know, £100, £200 a, a month. You know, so if you are going to get a coach, make sure that it's the right coach for you with the right level of experience. And that's really, really important. Otherwise, you may be better off, you know, working through, you know, programmes or asking friends than working with a coach that doesn't understand you and your life. But for me, very valuable. Next one, down the back there in the blue shirt. Yeah, um, I've been thinking about doing an Ironman next year. Um, my problem is I weigh 55 kilograms, I've got a very little body fat. You know, my I haven't got big muscles. Do you think that would sort of hold me back? The fact that I, you know, there's so little to me, sort of covering such a huge distance. One word answer, no, but I'll elaborate. If you go to an Ironman race, I don't know if you've ever been to one. I've done a lot. You'll um, see all types of people. You'll see all shapes, all sizes. You'll see people, you know, men from your way up to, you know, people that are 20 stone and everything, everything in between. And you'll look at them and you think, how on earth have they just got round this course? And, and I'm sure everyone that's done these races can concur. There's not one body type that is suitable for triathlon. If you look at all the professional men and women, we're all built very, very differently. You know, Craig Alexander is uh, probably 75 kilos. My husband is a pro athlete. He raced at 85 kilograms. Very, very different. 
you your you have to use your your body shape, um, your physiology to your advantage. So you might struggle in the swim, especially in a cold swim. You might struggle with buoyancy, but you're going to be one hell of a runner because you're not dragging a lot of body weight around. What you will have to be mindful of is is obviously nutrition and making sure that you're fueling your body correctly. But you know, I think it's it's about the engine that's inside, and, and it's about making yourself as holistically healthy as you can be. But there's absolutely no reason why you can't do an Ironman. You might want to do it in a slightly warmer climate than here. And that's, that's all joking aside, because someone, I, I mean, I was a lot leaner when I was racing. I suffered in the cold. I was fortunate that a lot of the um, important races were in warmer climates. Because if, if a race was in cold conditions, I would suffer like a dog. So you might want to bear that in mind, although financially it's obviously difficult. But if you can fly to Europe, then it's definitely worth doing an Ironman um, over there. But no, good luck. You can do it. Who's got another one? Anyone else? Go for it. A bit more broad than, than what you've already discussed. I heard your views on Lance Armstrong and uh, getting into triathlon, which I completely agree with. Um, I'm interested in your views on that crisis in athletics at the moment and how triathlon avoids it. Yeah, very difficult to discuss that in such a short space of time. It's really, it's really, really important, um, important topic. I think all the governing bodies need to up their game. Um, unfortunately, the only weapon we have at the moment is testing and it lags far behind um, unfortunately for the clean athletes all we have is testing to prove that we're clean so you know I've been the subject of accusations all I can say is come and test me and then people say well the tests are pointless you can avoid the test you can circumvent the test what else can we do you know one one year I had 19 tests 13 of which were blood tests, including the blood profile, and still people question you. So the testing needs to um, keep pace with um, the, the dopers and the scientists and the scientists behind them. Um, unfortunately, I think that means giving le more lenient sentences to those that have been found guilty but are willing to disclose some of their strategies. Mm -hmm. You have to take something, give something to, to get something, and we need to better understand who's providing this, who are the doctors that are providing them, how do they manage to circumvent the test? Because without knowing that, it's impossible to develop strategies to, um, to address it. But I'm worried about the state of athletics. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think fortunately in professional triathlon it's a lot cleaner than people might imagine. I think in the age group ranks um, I wouldn't be so sure that it's it's clean, unfortunately. Um, but I do think in the professional ranks I'm competing against a majority of people that are that are that are that are clean athletes. But ultimately this costs money, and if governments are not willing to invest, if companies, if sponsors are not willing to invest, then we're never ever going to be able to address the problem. Because WADA's budget is minuscule. You know, UK sports budget to address doping is minuscule. And unfortunately it's going to require a lot of investment at a time where that money is not available. Um, and lastly, I'd like to see sponsors taking a much more of a hard line against those that have doped. Yes, they can come back. Whether or not we agree with that is another matter. I think it should be a lifetime ban for for very, you know, for serious offences. But people at the moment as stands, people can come back and the least we can do is ensure that they don't necessarily get the commercial support that could be given to other other cleaner athletes, but that's a commercial decision on behalf of, of the sponsors, but I hope that they start to make those 
start to make those decisions. But if, if anything positive can come out of it, it's the fact that it's shining a spotlight on this, and that's a, that's the only way change will happen. It's the only way change happens in cycling. Change did happen in cycling, although it's not clean. I'm convinced that it's cleaner than it was. Now, unless anyone else has got any burning questions, or you can even save them for Chrissy directly, it's probably time to get the best selfie you're going to get this year. Um, you've got to come up, you've got any books, one signing, t-shirts, one signing, get your photo, 